Check out our mailing list, which has been quiet lately, so we promise there won't be many messages unless somebody starts posting to it. Uh, we have a meetup group where you probably learned about this meeting, and a Slack channel, which Angelo started, but he's not here tonight. But uh, if you're interested in joining the Slack, just let us know, we'll hook you up. Uh, we have videos of most of our meetings from the last five years at that URL, job postings, which are very heavily filtered. I think the last one was uh, they had some sort of uh, database developer in Miami with no relocation package, I think was the last one we didn't post to that group. <laughs> so feel free to join that list if you're interested in local jobs because it's just local jobs that have to do with Java. We don't post about 98% of the stuff that gets posted there. And meetup.com keeps growing. so. Thanks for finding us and thanks for coming out. If you like O'Reilly books and you pay for them yourself, or you like your employer and you don't want them to spend extra, you can give them this discount code and get half off the ebooks. So, Java News. The conference season is upon us, and Spring One got the jump on everyone else, and Christoph went. So, yeah. It was in Vegas this year. Uh, anything you wanted to? Say about highlights? Uh, yeah, they say that they will release uh, Spring 5 in March with or without JDK uh, 9. And uh, if they do, they will probably release 5.1 with uh, full support for JDK 9. Well, that's pretty cool. And they were having tons of uh, examples and tutorials on, uh, based on the reactive programming. Reactive. So for um, HTTP request or database connections and this. Cool. It seems to be pretty cool. So JDK9 and Reactive being the big themes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, the original promise, I remember last year's spring one when the J JDK9 release date was this September, like a month from now, they, uh, yeah, they promised to release spring five on the same day as JDK9 with full JDK9 support. So they're keeping to that, but probably jumping, jumping ahead a little bit based on the pre-release. Excellent. Reactive programming would also be an excellent talk for a future meeting, if anybody's interested. We always like having speakers. Uh, right, so speaking of JDK 9, we are now 209 days away from the current release date. And as you can see from this handy progress bar, we have passed the feature complete date of May 26th, and the more recent August 11th, all tests run deadline, which uh, the schedule looks like that. So we're just starting to reach these milestones of the revised JDK 9 release schedule. Um, and the all tests run, in case you're wondering, was defined as all of the planned tests have run at least once on each supported platform. That's good. <laughs> hey guys, come on in. Uh, Try to sit somewhere where you can see the screen. There's one seat. Probably you could squeeze two people in there. And there's several seats here where you can probably see the screen at a severe angle. Yep. Yeah, there's a few seats here that are available as well. Okay. Hey. You're welcome to that seat. That's that's not taken. Right, so rent down start September 1st. So this is where they become more concerned about people trying to change stuff in the JDK 9 code base. So in phase one, only priority one through priority three bugs can be fixed. Everything else has to wait for future point releases. And in phase two, which they didn't put a Oh, yeah, they did. They put a date on it. It's December 1st. Only showstopper bugs can be fixed. So I have a feeling whoever the JIRA admin for OpenJDK is, now they're probably accepting donations for elevating the priority of bugs, in case you want to fix them. In Jug News, there are now 387 
probably active Java user groups in the world, so that's pretty cool. With uh, Shenzhen China being the latest added. All right, so there's uh, deprecation updates that have been on the plan for JDK 9 for some time. There was actually a talk about this at DevOx last year. And uh, there's just been a few new revisions made to this JDK enhancement. Basic idea is the at deprecated annotation is getting some new attributes that it, it didn't have attributes before. Now it's getting for removal, which is a Boolean, and since, which is a string. So the, the problem was there's been stuff that's been deprecated since JDK 1.1 and still hasn't been removed. So it's been like 18 years that, that some of these APIs have been deprecated and still exist. So the question now is, will they ever be removed? Were they going to be removed? So the idea of this JEP is to put a finer point on deprecations, existing ones as well as future ones. So the idea is if something is deprecated for removal, that means it's actually going away in a future release. Whereas things that are deprecated not for removal, they're just, there's something better that you should check out, but you're not basically uh, digging, digging a hole for yourself by using that API. It's just that you're, you're inflicting pain upon yourself that you otherwise wouldn't need to have. So that's part one is, is that sort of classifying deprecation as whether or not it's for removal. Um, second part of the JEP is to now apply the deprecated annotation to a bunch of APIs that existed in Java 8. Some of them were already deprecated. They're going to be marked with for removal. Some of them are newly deprecated as of Java 9. And then there's a new change. This just happened last month. This JEP is going to change the Java standard so that compilers have to issue a warning if you're using a deprecated for removal type. And even if you're using suppress warnings deprecation, you'll still get a warning that you're using a deprecated for removal API. And so there's a new suppress warnings for those who are particularly adventurous about upgrading, which is suppress warnings dep removal, which will really suppress even the things that are actually going away in the future. So are we not just starting an arms race of, of, de of more deprecations and more ways to ignore the <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The answer is yes. They, they should just replace these things with an integer and just save everyone a bunch of time. <laughs> <laughs> Deprecation severity, or it'd yeah, be like exactly. <laughs> probability of removal. It's kind of like a forecast. <laughs> so I got 40%. Yeah. yeah. Like today's thunderstorm, right? No, it should be a countdown. That's what it should be. Oh, a countdown. That's good. It's like DEF CON. Yep. DEF CON. Like Depreca <laughs> Deprecation condition one. Like you have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So here's a list. Uh, it's not the full list, but uh, for your perusal, a list of the APIs that are either getting newly deprecated, being deprecated for removal, or in the case of the very lucky Java AWT component show and hide, they're being undeprecated. They're here to stay. The very last one. Removing the deprecated annotation from two <laughs> existing methods that were previously deprecated. Yeah. So show and hide, all those years that I wrote jframe.setVisibleTrue, because jframe.show, which was inherited from component, was deprecated. Turns out I could have said show. <laughs> it's fine. It's not deprecated anymore. So there you go. That's not the whole list, but that was the list in the mailing list post. Also, on the topic of deprecation, OK, just I'll give you. 30 seconds to read that, and then raise your hand if this bugs you too. Bugs me. Okay. Yeah. So the deprecated annotation has no way of saying why it's deprecated or what you should use instead. But there's the extremely similarly named at deprecated Java doc tag where you can explain all of that stuff. And now it's officially considered an error if you don't also explain yourself when you deprecate something. So that makes me happy. What would make me happier is if they put a reason attribute on the deprecated annotation. But 
guess we can't have nice things. You can't do that anyway. You can't just add it, right? Or can you add an optional framework? No. So you'd have to deprecate the deprecated. You'd have to deprecate deprecated, yeah. Nice. Or you could extend it. You could extend Is it. it. Uh, are <laughs> annotations final? I don't think you can yeah, subclass. You can't, you can't subclass No. <laughs> Need a That's right. In Spring, you can compose annotations. You can make a composed annotation, which is like friendly deprecated that has an explanation. <laughs> anyway, no Java updates this month. So yay, Oracle Java security team. We made it a whole month without an emergency update. All right, anything else? Nothing else happened. All right. So, time for the main event. All right, uh, I'm Donnie. My presentation tonight is the JVM does what? Where I'm going to tell you about a lot of different crazy things that the JVM JIT compiler does to optimize your code. So if you don't know what the JIT compiler is, um, you start off with Java code, and then after you run it through Java C, you end up with, uh, with bytecode in .class files. And then normally, the JVM will take that, and it'll run it in an interpreted mode. So it will run all of your instructions um, simulating a machine. That's why it's the Java virtual machine, because it's simulating a machine rather than running them natively. So if you have an instruction where you want to add two variables together, the JVM knows inside of it. Um, Kind of it, it will see the instruction, OK, you want to add these two variables. It'll go and look up the values, add them together, and then put the result out, rather than running the machine code instruction to add these two variables together. It also has what's called the JIT compiler, the just-in-time compiler. What this does is uh, it will kick in after you've run some code enough times that it, it thinks it's worth it to compile it. Uh, it will go turn it into machine code, optimize it, and then it will switch over to running that instead of the interpreted code. And the idea is that uh, it can make it faster because it's running machine code, but also because it has some profiling information as well. It has some knowledge about how you're invoking that method. And that is the end of my slides. <laughs> <laughs> so take in that nice, beautiful slide there, the, uh, all the arrows and everything. So on to uh, coding, which will be the rest of this. Um, all right, uh, so to start off, uh, I'm going to write a really, really bad benchmark, and then we're all going to improve it, ideally in the way that I planned. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Uh, so first, I'm going to make kind of just a, a simple method to run a computation. And I, I've injured my hand, so forgive my typing speed. Decided to make a presentation that is entirely typing because of that. <laughs> All right. So we have a method. We take uh, some input, and then we're just going to loop over it, multiply it a bunch of times, take up some time. Now I'm going to write a very, very bad test harness. And this is what we're going to improve. This is what we're starting with. We have this computation up top. We uh, use nano time to get really accurate time. We call our function once. We get the end time, and then we print out how long it took. So I'm going to run this. And we get, actually, sorry, that should be uh, nanoseconds. That's going to bug me. 
So it took 1,200 nanoseconds. You can run it a few times. See, it's, it's quite consistent. Now the question for you, what's wrong with this? It's actually surprisingly consistent. Look at that. 1,200 nanoseconds every time. D do we believe that this function takes exactly 1,200 nanoseconds? No? Are we suspicious just because I'm asking? <laughs> so what, uh, what should we change then? What's wrong with this benchmark? Run it like a million times. Run it a million times, OK. I'm not going to run it a million, but I will run it more times. Choose the magic number 30 times. Look at that. Still uh, 1,600 first time. Yeah, still uh, pretty consistent. I have a feeling your clock resolution is about 1,000 nanoseconds. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, 30 times. You said a million. We'll, we'll bump it up, though. Even though when we run it 30 times, it's still quite consistent. Oh, look at that. You think it's just a random number that it's printing in? That is a good point, and we will get to that later on in my plan. For now, we'll, uh, we'll go with the spirit of the run it a million times, and we'll run it uh, 300 times. Now it starts to get faster. So before it was taking about 12,000 nanoseconds, now down to 1 or 2,000 nanoseconds. No. Yeah, exactly. That comment of it got compiled. That's the, the claim that, uh, so th this is what I was mentioning before, that it runs in interpreted mode until it's run a few, uh, a few thousand times. Uh, in this case, it's because it's a loop. It doesn't have to run that many times for the outside one. Um, but when it gets JIT compiled, then it gets faster. And I will demonstrate that to you by using the argument. Um, that is, no, oh, that's very tiny. Dash xx colon print compilation. If you run it with uh, that and you spell it correctly, Dash x x colon dash x x colon plus print compilation. Very intuitive. Yeah. You want to add the print compilation uh, parameter. If you add that argument, then what the JVM will do is it will print out whenever uh, it compiles a method. Here we see it's taking you know twelve or thirteen hundred nanoseconds. Then it prints out. It's on different lines just because we're we're rapidly printing. It prints out that it has compiled the demo compute method. And then it starts taking only 1,000 uh, or 2,000 nanoseconds to run. So now I'll ask again, are, are we confident that this method, compute, takes about 1 or 2,000 nanoseconds to run? Is there anything wrong, anything else wrong with this benchmark? I think we're throwing away the result. We're throwing away the result. We'll get to that soon as well. Right. One other one that uh, I will. Again, follow the spirit of run it a million times. A oh, sure, sorry. Uh, again, I'll follow the spirit of run it a million times. We'll run it uh, 3,000 times. Actually, we'll run it 30,000 times. There we go. Now it starts taking zero. Oh, it took uh, one. It took zero. Every once in a while, the clock will tick. Yes. That's why it's printing at zero here. Um, so what can we do to fix this besides your suggestion? Wait, we have this when we run it one time, we time it, it takes no time at all. What can we do? What happens if you, if you make the for loop on line four count to a million instead of a thousand? Make the for loop on line four count to a million instead of a thousand? I will do the equivalent of, uh, I will call compute multiple times. All right. Yes, I want that. 
and I will make this just 10. So 10 times what we're going to do is we're going to start the timer, we're going to call compute 10,000 times, and the timer, and then print it out. What we get is, at first it takes time, then it takes no time. OK, so let's make this uh, bigger. 1,000. Still does it. Maybe, maybe it's just really, really fast when it, uh, when it runs. We'll go one better than a million. We'll go one billion times we'll run it. And it still takes no time. This method is like it, it's taking time completely independent of the number of times we're calling it. And now at this point, I will uh, invoke your suggestion of we're throwing away the output. The reason that this is happening is because of something called dead code elimination in the JVM. When it compiles your method, it's looking at what you're doing. And if it can determine that you aren't using the result, then it'll basically just turn it into a no op. And you may as well just even this whole thing, comment all of that out. We can avoid that by saving the output and doing something with it. And because I know this, how long this takes, I will <laughs> reduce it down to just one million. Now let's run it. So now it's taking about uh, 1.4 seconds each time because we're actually using the output. Using the output is forcing the JVM JIT compiler to not throw it away and just turn it into an OOP, no op. And you do actually have to use it. If I comment this out, if we, we have double result, we add to it, but then we don't do anything with it. Oh. OK, I guess. Oh, wait. Is that one? No. OK, I guess it's not smart enough to figure that part out. Even though I'm pretty sure it did before. You said it run a thousand times to re relearn. We'll wait. <laughs> hmm. I'm a bit confused about that, but anyway, well, uh, we'll go on with it. The, uh, the other part, though, is that I will prove to you that it's actually doing a no-op by showing you another, uh, another JVM argument that you can use. If I changed it to something random, in this case it doesn't, but potentially it could. What's the question? Uh, if I, I'm always calling it with compute one, could I change that to be passing something random in? Would that change the runtime? And yeah, in this case it won't, but potentially it could. Um, that's what I will show you. I will cheat and copy and paste the command. You can actually tell the JVM to print out what it compiles your code to. So the, the Java code that you have is not necessarily what it will actually compile it to. It's not just a straightforward transformation. You've seen that it will look at it, and if things are unused, it will get rid of them, et cetera. So if we do this, we're telling the JVM to print out um, what it does. So this is the case where it takes zero nanoseconds. Actually, it's probably easier to see if I do it the uh, other way first. It's not necessary, I'll do it. Um, right. I want to extract this to a method to make it easier to print out. That's what I called it. Now, this is very giant and hard to read, but I'll do my best. So with this, we've told the JVM to print out when it compiles it. Here we have the method um, calculate in demo. We have a bunch of assembly stuff here. 
If I scroll down through some of the boilerplate, you can see here this uh, multiplication instruction. This is what we're doing with the repeatedly multiplying by 1.01. If you scroll over in some places, it even gives you a hint about what line number it's compiling. Uh, and this part, the reason why we have so many of them is just another minor optimization it does is called loop unrolling. This is where if you have uh, a giant loop that you're repeating doing the same thing, it might be more efficient to repeat that instruction multiple times in a block of, in this case, I think 16 or so and then loop because looping in the CPU has some overhead. So this is the regular one where we're looping, we have it unrolled, we're doing stuff here. If we don't use the output, then we'll see, I'll be able to uh, show you. It takes zero nanoseconds to run the entire block. And if we scroll up, this is the entire method, it's just you know, a method call and then return. We're not doing any multiplication. We're not doing any calculation in there. Now, there's a bunch of different benchmark pitfalls that this shows. Danny, last time you did that, when you took out the printout, yes. it still said like one, one and a half seconds, but it didn't this time. That's yeah. right. Oh, maybe it didn't compile. Oh, you're not using this. Oh, I'm not using it here. There are many, many pitfalls in uh, benchmarking. That's actually my next topic. That, uh, oops. So let's definitely print out the result. Result was zero because I have to use it here. Now it's using it. Actually, I'm curious, what if I don't use it here? Don't use it there, it should. I don't know, not enough to fool it. It still runs it. Anyway, the, the pitfalls that we've seen here are um, the, the big one is not using the output. This is really common in micro benchmarks. You're trying to figure out how long a certain method takes. Um, so you run it in a loop, but you don't store the output. You don't do anything with the output. And then the JVM JIT compiler just ignores it. The other one here is um, the warm-up period that we saw at the very beginning. You have to run it a bunch of times to give it some time to actually run the JIT compiler in the first place. And the last one is the, the magic number that I used of an appropriate number of loops for it to be able to measure it accurately. Um, I happened to put that in at the, at the time, but this is something that you would have to go if, if it did take only a few hundred or a few thousand nanoseconds to run your method, you would have to loop over it a bunch of times. Now, this would be really annoying if you have to do all this work yourself, which is why there is a project called JMH. It's a, uh, a test harness for doing these kinds of micro benchmarks. I've already set this up and I'll show you how to use it. Uh, the ideal way of doing this kind of calculation is just you take your one method that you want to benchmark uh, this is what JMH gives you when you run the, the Maven thing to get it. And then I'll just run it with one. And all you have to do is run it, you, and you have to make sure that you return the output, um, whatever you were computing or some result of the method. And then it will make sure that it doesn't get taken away by the JIT compiler for not being used. And it will also do all of the timing loops <coughs> and that stuff. So I can show you that in this tab. And we run this command, uh, ignore the arguments for now. It will do some warm up iterations, run it a bunch of times, and then run it for real. 
and then print out a number of how many times it was able to run it per second. So you don't have to do all of that uh, benchmarking stuff yourself. Yeah. Questions about this? I have one just about the JIT compiler. Yep. Is there a way that I can prime it so that if a client's using my app, it already has been run like a thousand times? Can you prime the JIT compiler? Uh, the only way to do it that I know of would be if you just run the method a thousand times. Oh, like a, and actually 10,000 times. But you may not want to do that because of some things I'll show you a bit later on. <laughs> we can also change the compiler threshold. Yeah, good point. A lot of apps call methods with different patterns and different inputs early in the startup. And then as they get processing real stuff, the patterns change. So having that having that buffer early on of, of just running an interpretive mode before you compile it can actually help on your performance. Yeah, that's a good point. All right, next one that we're going to do. We're going to try to benchmark another um, bit of code. So we have an interface, we have a simple imp implementation. It will just uh, multiply the input by 1.1. I'm going to make a method that will call it a ton of times. And I'm deliberately not using JMH because I'm going to show another, uh, another benchmarking pitfall that you can have. So we multiply by 1.1. We call it 100 million times, I think it is. And now I'm going to do uh, a bit of a weird thing because I want to be able to swap out the implementation of calculate while we're running. Um, which one will I do? First, our harness. Fix that later. So when we run this thread, we're just going to do a simple, uh, well, we're, we're going to continuously loop. We're going to grab whatever the current value of this is, which I'll add in later, time it, uh, and then print it out. Now the main part. So 
So this will just continuously print out how long it's taking. Now the, the fun part that we're going to do is we will try to benchmark how long it takes with different numbers and see how that works out. See if there's any difference here. Bets on uh, whether it will be different or not. We start off with uh, calc 1, which is multiplied by 1.1. Wait for input from the keyboard, and then switch to 2. Same thing, switch to 3. It's not cooperating with what I want it to do, but it will still be OK. So it takes about uh, 240 milliseconds. Switch to a new one. Speeds up, but then slows down. <laughs> Interesting. Let's uh, switch to a new one. And it takes longer. Very weird. And now let me do uh, one more thing here, which is let's. Uh, which way does it want to do it? Yeah. Uh, start off the other way. So uh, what we had found before, you know, 1.1 takes a while, 1.2 takes a little bit longer, 1.3 takes even longer. Let's go again, but we've uh, reversed the orders. Now we do 3, then 2, then 1. So the longest one first. But it's fast. Next one, fast for a little while, and then slow. Now the fastest one before goes back to being slow. What's happening here? <laughs> so to uh, find out what's happening here, oops, we're going to have to use the similar parameters before, print out what it's compiling to, and then see what, uh, what's going on. Okay, good. Now it's doing what I want. So the, uh, that weird part about when I hit enter and then it goes fast and then slow again, I only saw that today. This is the normal way that it, uh, that it ran, <laughs> which is it runs quickly first. Let me uh, lock this, and I will show the typo. It's not printing out. But it runs the same way the second time. So I wanted to print out compilation on calculate. Come on, do the same thing. Do the same thing. Good. OK, so prints out uh, quickly. And if we scroll up to the code, this is going to be hard to read because it's so big. But the The important part is the, uh, where is it? Oh yeah, here. Um, so it's this uh, implicit exception dispatch part, which Jonathan had predicted. It's when, uh, when we are running this method, um, and I'll show that method again. 
long calculate, we're passed an interface, and then we call it a ton of times and then return the total. Instead of actually calling out to that, it's just inlining all the code in this method. And instead, at the very beginning, it, it's inlining the code of calc1. And at the very beginning, it's doing a single if statement saying, if this variable c is not equal to calc1, then throw an exception, do something else. But otherwise, it will do this fast code about uh, just inlining all the code there. So if I go back to the bottom, it's very fast. It goes back to your earlier comment that in modern processors, jumps are very expensive. Yes. So I hit Enter, and it will take a small amount more time. Instead of 120, it goes to 240. Pretty much double. And if I scroll up here, what we have, let's see, the second one. We have two checks for this implicit exception. Now we have one for calc1 and for calc2, so it takes longer. It will still put all that code in one method. It will inline all the code for calc1 and for calc2 in, in that one method with kind of a, a kind of if check at the beginning, if it's one of those two. And if so, then it will do all this inline code. And I'll just scroll through it. You can see that it's very, very giant because it's inlining all that code. Go so ahead. it built, I'm just asking, it, it built a new compiled method that checks what kind of calc you passed in. Yeah, sorry, that, that's the other really cool There's part. Like a switch statement in there, like in the machine code. Yes, it's that it had compiled it before, and we were running it for you know, tens of seconds. But then after I switched the input, when it hit that exception case, it then recompiled the code, knowing that I pass in calc1 and calc2 sometimes. So it recompiled it, knowing that both of those are there, and it made this giant method of inlining it, optimizing it, all that stuff. So let's go to the bottom. We're taking you know, 280 milliseconds, and we'll go to the last one where it takes the longest time. Now it takes 300 milliseconds, 340-ish. And if we scroll up here, we'll see if I can lock that. We'll see a very, yes, uh, we'll see a much shorter method where all it's doing is the interface, like the, the actual virtual call. Because when I pass in one, it just inlines everything. It says, OK, I assume you're that one, and I'm just going to throw kind of a, an internal exception if it's not. When it's two, it'll again, special case, fine. You pass in two. I'll put them both in. Three, that's too much. That, that's when it gives up. Doesn't make this kind of switch statement at the beginning and says, fine, I'll just call the method. Like we're now actually, and it takes the longest. We're now actually dealing with an object-oriented programmer. Yes. And if I, uh, I can also show you that uh, because it's then recompiled the method, so we have it now. Oh, wait. Kill that, kill that. So we're starting off calc 1. And this time it takes a long time, which uh, I'll talk about in a minute. We do it again, recompiles it. It takes slightly longer. We do it a third time. Now it takes the longest because it's doing that virtual method dispatch. With uh, So we've done calc 1, calc 2, and calc 3. And now if I go back to calc 1, it still takes a long time because it's still using that, uh, that kind of the method that it's actually calling the method. And yeah, like you said, you've ruined it forever. Yeah. And <laughs> this, this reason, as well as my struggle of trying to get it to, if you notice this one, the first time it was doing that kind of medium speed one, whereas before it was the short one, for that reason, and also for this reason of you being able to ruin a method based on what parameters you're passing it, if you are benchmarking a method like this, where you pass in an interface, you have to fork the JVM again. You can't just reuse the same JVM because it's doing its profiling. It's going to change how it's run the method depending on what, uh, what type of argument you've passed to it before. You've completely killed it. So instead, the way around that is by running your benchmark one time on one JVM with calc1. And then you kill that JVM. You start up a new one. You do calc2. And I won't uh, copy and paste this over, but this is one of these parameters that I didn't explain here. It's the dash F1. 
the default is 10, but this is how many times it will fork the JVM. And by default, it will actually, so actually there's two, uh, two things here. One of them is that when you're testing different, uh, those different implementations, Calc 1 and Calc 2, you want to have a different JVM. And so each individual test has to be run on a different JVM. It has to be independent. But also what you would see in where sometimes when I ran it the first time, it would be fast. See, now it's the medium speed. Sometimes it would be fast, even though the code hasn't changed at all. It's just the profiler can be finicky, and sometimes it makes a decision one way or the other. And so even when you're testing the same code, you have to fork the JVM multiple times to get a good uh, read on how fast it would go. So this time it's going to be the same because this is just my old code. Um, but just to demonstrate, JMH will fork it multiple times for each measurement that it takes because of that reason. Any questions about that? Is, is there ever a way to trigger de-optimization so it will reconsider? Can you trigger a de-optimization so it will reconsider? I'm not sure. I've seen things be de-optimized because new classes get loaded, but yep. I don't know if that de I doubt it de-optimizes everything, probably just the things that would be affected. No, it, it's supposed to do some class hierarchy ana analysis, so it will only do the ones that it uh, so needs to. You maybe have to introduce a new type in the same type hierarchy as calculation. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. Actually, uh, the, the demo that I was trying to give was uh, demoing it doing this kind of class uh, hierarchy analysis where you load a new class at runtime, but I couldn't actually get it to work. I couldn't get it to do what I wanted. Oh, okay. yeah. it, it never acted differently for me. I've tried building demos like that and it has the same result. Yeah. It can be finicky. Uh, what's that? Okay. Third one. Um, Let's make that bigger. Um, let's do a quick uh, quiz. This is some C code now. When we run this C, what happens? Segmentation, Segmentation fault, yes. Right. Segmentation fault, because we are um, well, we, we would want a null pointer exception. What we're doing is we're dereferencing a null pointer here. And in C, when you do that, you get a seg fault. And if you want to debug this, you can see here the output that you get is just segmentation fault. In C, when you want to debug this, you have to go and recompile it with debug symbols, load it in GDB, um, and then try to reproduce whatever caused it to seg fault. And then you would find the information of where it actually was. There are some other techniques, too. In Java, luckily, when we do this kind of thing, accessing a null pointer, you get a helpful null pointer exception telling you where, uh, what line was null, or what, what, line, uh, what line it came from. Um, but if you think about this, for the JVM to be able to do this, it basically, you would think, has to add an if statement every time you're calling a method on an object. Because if that object is null, then it has to throw a null pointer exception. It's like programming in Go. Like programming in Go. <laughs> so if I, do I have a system out here? So if you trace through just one call, system.out.println, if out is null, then you know, it, it has to have an if statement there and throw a null pointer. We go in here, we go in print, go in write. Again, we got a bunch of things. We're calling text.out.write. If text out is null, you have to throw a null pointer. This thing, it has to check. This thing it has to check. If we go here, do we do more? Uh, and you can just keep on going. And oops. even for a simple thing, you have lots and lots of, uh, or you, you would have lots of null checks if the reference is null. And that would be really annoying if it had to, every single time you call a method, it has to add a null check in the code. And it would be nice if there was a faster way for, do it, for it to do it. And that's what I'm going to show you now. This is probably one of, one of my favorite uh, optimizations that the, uh, the JVM does. It's how it handles nulls in a better way. So let me uh, let's see, make a uh, quick demo for this. So I'm going to have a method where I'm just going to 
call um, call a method. We just call two uppercase on a string. And by the way, I'm showing you in uh, a Linux VM because there's a tool that I want to use to prove to you what it's doing. I'm just going to call it a bunch of times to get it to JIT compile. I don't want to actually print it out, but this should be enough to make it not go to nothing. Actually, it should probably be JIT compiled anyway, so maybe that's not necessary. Now I'm going to call it a few times with different arguments. had to do before IDEs type literally everything. <laughs> yes, I have you as a, uh, a compiler check. I have two typos. What lines? 3 and 13? 2, 3. This is line 3. Ah, good catch. You're better eyes than I do. And line 13, you're saying? Line 13, end quote. Now, are those the only typos I have? This will compile? Will, will it compile? <laughs> this is the junk jet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, winner. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. All right, so when I run it, it uh, warms up a bunch of times, tells me it's going to pass some string, prints it out, and it's going to pass null. We get a null pointer exception and then it prints done. Now, this is the part that you will possibly not believe. Yes, it was a shocking amount of work. But, but the, the cool part is what the JVM does to give you that null pointer exception. So I'm going to use a tool called strace. Uh, if you've never used it before, it will tell you what system calls um, uh, a process is using and we're going to use this to see what the JVM is doing so by the way learning S trace is a great life skill yeah it's really <laughs> like it if somebody gives you some random shitty program that doesn't work you can usually figure out why with S trace yeah I've had programs before where you run it and it'll say like can't find config file and it doesn't tell you where it's looking for the config file yes. And instead of going and, or maybe even the documentation doesn't tell you where it's going to look for it, or you think you put it there, you just run strace and then the program, and it will print out like everything that it's doing. And the last line is going to be opening, you know, slash home, slash whatever, slash underscore, slash config.txt. And then you see that's, that's the config file it's trying to open. That's where it was looking. Yes. Yep. Now we saw with uh, this C program. It does a, or it, uh, it has a segmentation fault. Now, we can actually use strace to show when something has a segmentation fault. Oops. Sig seg v. And then. So uh, S trace, we're telling it to trace signals, and we care about uh, sig seg v. That's the one that the process gets sent to tell it to seg fault. So we can see 
this part is the, uh, oops, these lines are from strace, and then the last one is from uh, the actual process. Now let's see what happens when we run demo. So going to pass ASDF, nothing. Going to pass null, and we get a sig seg v. The same thing that we got with our C program. Because, now, th now the explanation, the payoff for all that typing just to get a null pointer exception. The payoff is what the JVM will do is it will let it seg fault. It will just let you, you know, access a, a null pointer and then it will trap the, the seg fault or the, the sig seg v and then it will inspect the state of registers and like the state of the program, backtrack from there to figure out where in the program you were do any kind of cleanup that it wants, and then throw the null pointer exception from there. So, yep, go ahead. If you were in the middle of uh, inline method call, mm -hmm. figure that out. Yeah, good point. If, if you were in, in the middle of an inline method call or even multiple levels of an inline method call, it has to go and reconstruct the stack trace just from knowing you know, where in the compiled code it was. But the payoff from doing this is that the compiled code has no null check at all. There's no null, null check at all. It just invokes whatever methods it wants. And if you access protected memory, it lets it seg fault and then reconstructs everything from there. And I've told a few people about this, this before. Everybody always asks, like, what's the performance impact of this? Doesn't that take longer than just having an if check? Yeah, it does take a little bit of time. It would be quicker if you were going to throw a null pointer just to have you know, an if check in there and then do it. But the vast majority of the time, you don't throw a null pointer, and so you get that benefit there. Don't write code that uses null pointer exceptions for control of flow. Yes. But I will show you something else, too. Um, before, we were always passing the same parameter to that method. What about if sometimes we pass null, actually, and we need to catch that? And just don't bother. Now we, we get a bunch of those, whatever, from our passing null. We pass ASDF, it's fine. Now when we pass null, if I go up, no seg fault, because it profiled the code and realized that sometimes we pass null, so it's not worth it to do that whole seg fault uh, thing. So instead, it will insert a, an explicit null check. Is that cool? I, I think we need a round of applause for the, the JVM. <laughs> Oh yeah, questions. We have uh, array bounds checks that matter a lot too. Was that when we use array list and like old fashioned we use arrays? Array bounds checks. Every time we index into an array, the JPM has to be careful that we didn't index past the end. Yeah, I don't know that it can use the same trick because the memory on either side might still be valid, so you don't yeah, get a seg fault. Exactly. And That's where all the C bugs are. Right? It, it can't, e like, it could put a tiny block of memory before and after each array, but then what if you're off by too much? It would still be valid memory. Yeah. Um, but what I have heard is that it does do some analysis to uh, omit those array range checks when it can. For example, if it recognizes that you're doing a loop. You know, int i equals zero. Oh, okay. i is smaller than array dot length yeah. i plus plus. So then it knows like that. A controlled amount. Yeah, as long as you don't then go and switch what array is referencing at some point, because then like you do a bounds check the, or you do the length at the beginning, but then if you swap it out for an array that would be a different size, you could. But yeah, I've I've heard that it omits it in that way. So you could that would be interesting. Try some micro benchmarks where, for example, you just index an array with a for loop, or you index an array with a for loop where you say. I multiply the loop index by something and then divide it again. Yeah. And then maybe the VM has to put a bounce check after every array access. Yeah, it might. Yeah, you could probably trick with something like that. Interesting. 
All right, the uh, last thing I'm going to show you, we're going to try to beat the, uh, the JDK performance. Let's use this one, get rid of that chunk. We will lose? Yeah, I don't know. So the, uh, the method that we're going to try to beat is integer.bitcount. Yeah, so this is a method. It's very tiny. Um, it counts the, the number of bits in the binary representation of a number. So 7 is 111. That has three bits. We run it with. 8, that's 1000, zero, zero, zero. it has 1 bit. Use the, use the new Java 8 syntax for binary literals. Uh, my Eclipse is very old. Oh, but it's good enough. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, whoops, can't put threes in. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, uh, it just counts the number of bits um, in in the binary representation of that number. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to beat that without looking at how they do it. We'll implement it our own way. <laughs> what's, the, what's the way you want to do hash it? Hash map is the answer to all optimization problems in <laughs> You want a hash map? No matter what it is. How, how, <laughs> how would you like to use uh, a hash map in I'm this? I'm not sure. I'm just saying that is the solution we want. <laughs> I think you could. You could probably uh, pre-compute like eight, uh, yeah, eight bit chunks and then use some if bit twiddling to get zero, each eight bit one, chunks. One and then you have the lookup <laughs> table. <laughs> of, yeah. Yeah. When in doubt, guess seven. We'll try it a bit of a different way. We'll do it kind of the straightforward way. Go ahead. I was just going to say the answer is probably seven. <laughs> <laughs> so an integer has 32 bits. We're just going to go and check if each individual bit is equal to, uh, or yeah, is set. And if so, so we have uh, one, we shift it up by um, i, so 0 through 32. So for every, every bit there, we create kind of a bit mask for it. We and it with our input. And then we check if that's not equal to 0. And if so, so let's try that versus my bit count. And it should be same output. OK. So now let's make uh, a nice benchmark method for this. And we will use JMH for this, because at this point, the, the point is not to show you why you should use it. So let, let's just use it. And what we'll do is we'll just call this a bunch of times just for fun for different um, numbers. Yeah, let's do. Maybe the performance changes depending on what, uh, yeah, how many bits are set. So let's try out a bunch of different ones. JMT has to decide which half of the branch to do first. And let's try just so we have our own bit count. We're looping over it. We have our benchmark method where we're going to try out the first 800,000 uh, integers and try it with uh, my one versus the built-in one. Predictions on who will win? One fork. Mm -hmm. 
So this is the, the number of times wow. we can run it per second. The, the built-in one can do it. There's like two orders of magnitude there. Yes. Two orders of magnitude. It can do it nearly 4,000 times per second, whereas the one that we collectively have created right now, right now <laughs> that, that's on all of you, <laughs> can only run 42 times per second. Yeah. Now that's uh, okay. So let, let's see what they're doing that's so good. It's a nice, uh, nice complex bit twiddling here. They do it in just constant time operations. Yeah. Pretty cool. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> so the, this. It's like a deli painting of Jellico. Yes. This, uh, this pearl code here, this explosion of symbols, is much better than ours. But for fun. This is way more reasonable. Yeah, yeah. This is I can, if I had to maintain one or the other. <laughs> yeah. Ignoring how readable it is, let's take, uh, so everybody saw, I copy and pasted that one from uh, what I took. And let's see the benchmark here. Oh, yes. I'm scared now. Oops. Now let's see what happens. So R1, still pretty bad. The built-in one, still good. But our copy-pasted one, which we thought was good, it's not that good. Can I guess? What is your guess? My guess, my guess is that the JVM has some special, extra special um, optimizations for built-in methods that it knows you can't override or re-implement. Could I get another Creamore, please? Thanks. I guess that integer.bit count got vectorized by the JIT. So the, the proposal is that it has some magic for the built-in methods. Let me see where I am in. Uh, yes, now is the time to review. Actually, no. What, uh, <laughs> 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 By the way, this is proof that copy and pasting code is bad. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets slower. <laughs> one of yeah, one of the many slower. things that is bad about copying and pasting code, it can make it slower. <laughs> so, test integer count. And so, thanks. Let's try debugging this. Let's see what's actually going on here, what's being run. Set a breakpoint here. It's a very tiny breakpoint. Guess you can't change the font size of breakpoints. <laughs> and why are you complaining? Duplicate main method. Yes, I did have another main method. So let's debug it to see what's really going on. Let's just make sure. Nothing's being swapped out on us. First, we're calling our copy-pasted one. We look at that. You know, it's normal. It's exactly what we did. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. That uh, seems exactly what we expected. But now, let's try out the other one, the uh, built-in. See what happens here. So we go here, step inside, and it's the exact same thing. Yeah, I thought I bet you thought it was going to be different, didn't you? No, it's going to be slower. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's the exact same code. So we we can't tell by debugging this. Let's use our tool from before, which is printing out the code that it gets compiled to. Where is copy pasted? Let's go back to that one. And I will cheat again and just paste this in if I have it. 
This was... Oh, we'll just start. Whatever. So, the code here, if I can... I'll try running it a bunch of times. Also do shouldn't make a difference, but we'll do that anyway. Hmm. Anyone see my mistake? You guys should have caught this. I just taught you. Maybe this is it. Maybe, maybe. No, we're not debugging. Just run. Hmm. Okay, not sure why I can't get it to print out the code, but I'll spoil it anyway. The reason is what Jonathan mentioned earlier, it's that uh, if, if I could get this to, uh, to print out the code, what it would show you is that with our copy-pasted bit count, it's going, it's doing some, uh, um, some bitwise ands and some bitwise uh, shifts and unrolling them for optimization, and that's fine. But with the built-in one, it's using a different instruction. The assembly instruction that it's using is actually that there's one it will uh, invoke called pop CNT. The big reveal was going to be showing you this one, which is there's oh, actually wow. a built-in instruction on your CPU <laughs> to, uh, to, to give the number of bits in a number set to one. And the JVM, for its own implementation, is using that one, whereas for your copy-pasted one, it's doing what you literally told it. And the reason is because of JVM intrinsics. Uh, I want line 581. An intrinsic is... Uh, wait, 581. Yep. Uh, the JVM can actually say that for certain methods, it won't use the implementation that you have there. It will use its own one. So we see common ones here in java.lang.math. There's a bunch. And for most of them, I'll show you um, math.sign uh, is one, for example. When you call the sign method, it goes to strict math.sign. And here it's marked native. This is an, actually, th this is an intrinsic method provided by the, the JVM, but there are some other ones like bit count, where it's an intrinsic method, but it happens to have an implementation in the JDK. And the reason is that not all CPUs have that bit count instruction. So if you don't have it, it wants to have basically a fallback. And so it, you, you can write that fallback in Java and that's fine, but the JVM, can provide its own where it swaps out its implementation, even though it looks like it should be implementing that one. So that's the reason why when we copy paste it, we don't get that intrinsic because it's based on the class name. When you debug it, 
it does not execute the JIT compiled code, it will switch to interpreted mode. This is the reason why a lot of the times when you're debugging stuff, it, uh, it goes slowly. Because even if you don't hit that breakpoint, for a lot of things, it will switch to the interpreted mode. That's how all of Java would be before the, the JIT compiler. It's, it's as slow as it would be if you would set breakpoints everywhere, even if you didn't kind of hit them, even if you didn't <laughs> enable them. And there's one last thing I can show you, which is that there is actually a JVM argument that you can pass to tell it not to use intrinsic methods. So to avoid typos, I will do this. This is the, you can make it really big, unlock diagnostic JVM options, and then disable intrinsics, bit count i, this is what you would pull from uh, here, this underscore bit count i. And now, yes. No, I put it. Oh, dash jar. And one more thing that I need to, actually, I didn't compile it, so I think it's okay. So now that was our copy pasted one. This is the built in one. There. And now we see we're on level playing field with the JVM. When we disable the intrinsic that it was using, we now degrade to the performance of the actual code that you see in the JDK. Copy paste was slightly better. Yes, but uh, within, the within the margin of error, yes. <laughs> and you can play around with the, these parameters too. If, if I had done, like, you know, instead of three iterations, I could do 100. And then I'm sure it would reduce the error because you would get a much more stable measurement. Any questions about that? No? Cool. All right. And that's my presentation. Thank you all. I'll paste uh, these commands and the links to the, the group after. Yep, go for it. Why didn't you speak up before? <laughs> no, go ahead. How did I find all this? Some of them I had just seen on random blogs over the years, um, but there is actually a, I don't have the link to it. Uh, I'll paste the link as well. There's a list of just the, the JVM performance optimizations that they do. And then I, I had a few of these that I knew about, and then I went through that list to, to try to find one more. Actually, I, I don't know if there were any that I didn't know about before. <laughs> but yeah, there, there's just like a list of all the optimizations that the JVM performs. And you can look through the code as well, the, the JVM code, to see what it's doing for them. The tricky part sometimes can be trying to get it to do what you want. Like writing the Java code such that when it is JIT compiled, it will trigger the optimization that you intend. There are a few I wanted to show that I couldn't because I, I just couldn't get it to do what I wanted. Has it affected the way that I've coded knowing these optimizations? Not really. <laughs> it, uh, it's very useful for benchmarking. Knowing about all these things, like then you, you can get in the habit about always using output, all that stuff. But using JMH, you don't need to know as many of them, but you do still need to know, um, like you can still make mistakes with JMH. It just makes it harder to make mistakes. I would say if you want to modify the way you write code based on this, the lesson to learn is write normal code. Because all these optimizations are basically pattern matching based on what's normal. Yeah. So if you write normal code, it will run fast. And if you try to do something clever to make it faster, it will run slow. Actually, I can show you a. Uh, you find in the JDM, you should be a C developer writing JDM software. Yes, that's yes, correct. Right. Yeah. I know one such person, but he won't come here because he'd rather be canoeing in Algonquin Park. So on, on that note about write normal code, if I show. Oh, wait. I want to get it back to how it was a while ago. Not that far ago. 
So if we have this code, we run it, takes zero nanoseconds. All I have to do is change that to a long, and now it takes time. I found that because I was going to like make it a long and make it you know a hundred billion, a hundred trillion, and then it didn't do it. Yeah. So it doesn't do dead, lo dead code elimination when you pass along. Apparently, wow. that like that that tiny change, that tiny change is enough to throw it. Nobody uses a long as a for loop index. So Nobody needs a loop that big. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, seriously. Well, that's they, they use Maven Centralized for the purpose of figuring out what why hmm. or not. Well, it's a good way of doing How it. How many for loops have a long index in Maven Central? Probably almost none. Yeah. yeah. Hmm.